Hello again. In this session, I want to talk about how you write product use cases. Where we are in the scheme of things is uh, we've learned to work using various trawling techniques. Uh, with the stakeholders, you've determined the desired future work. We spoke about that earlier in this lesson. And we've determined the product that will best support that future work. Suzanne spoke about that in the last session. And now I want to talk about how we demonstrate that proposed product to the stakeholders and we'll be using uh, product use case scenarios to do it. So this is getting into the future. We're coming down below the horizontal line. We're talking about how. This is the brown cow model that we've been showing you throughout the various sessions. And we're talking about the future how. In other words, the technological solution that we're going to be using. Deciding the automation that we're using in this piece of work. Here's the piece of work I'm talking about. I built a data flow model of it. You can see on the left the adjacent system. A customer sends an order in and that data flow crosses the work boundary and triggers a response, which you see all the activities and data being used across here. Now, you came along and determined how much of that would be automated. Suzanne showed you something like this where you can draw a line on the model and saying that's my product boundary. In other words, everything to the right, every activity and data to the right of that line is going to be the automated product. Or I might put the product boundary over here and now I've got a bigger, more elaborate automated system that takes in more of the work. Alternatively, I might put it right out here now I've automated everything. I've taken all the manual processes out of it. I've ended up with a completely automated system. So somehow you're playing with this, determining which is the optimal system to build, and now you have to describe it. I want to introduce a piece of terminology here, which is a product use case. Now the product use case, or PUC, is whatever you decide to build. The product use case is the part of the buck, the business use case we've been talking about, that you're about to automate and turn into your product. So we've got bucks and pucks. The buck is the business use case, that's the description of the work. The puck is the product use case, which is the part of the buck that you've decided to automate, and that's the one we're going to describe with a product use case or puck scenario. You need to be able to describe your puck to the stakeholders and developers because that's what you're about to spend money on uh, by building the automated product. Uh, we have a number of ways of doing that. We can uh, use a BPMN or a UML activity diagram. These are popular with the more technically oriented people. Some business people find them a little bit hard to use. Or I can use a puck scenario, which I think is a much more business-friendly scenario. And here I'm saying I've got a precondition for this product use case. The order has been received and is syntactically correct. So I'm ignoring anything uh, which is not in that condition. Step one, check the stock level to see if it's sufficient on hand. Step two, if it's insufficient, find an alternative and notify the customer. Place the original order on back order. And that's the end of my if insufficient. Otherwise, I generate a picking list, send that to the warehouse and generate an invoice and send it to the customer. And that's the end of my scenario. So let's talk about how we write these scenarios. Scenario is just a sequence of steps that's going to accomplish something. In this case, the objective of the product use case. I'm suggesting you use a limited number of steps, uh, suggesting somewhere between three and 10. It's not really all that important, but if you've got 127 steps in your scenario, uh, you're really writing lines of code and nobody's going to read it. Start with the normal case. The normal case is that nothing goes wrong. I know things are going to go wrong, but we'll come back to that a little bit later. Use the stakeholders language, whatever their business language is, try and include their terms so they recognize them. And your intention is to demonstrate the product you intend to build. So here's a sample of one. A wholesale customer returns some beer is what's happening here. Step one, the product accepts the return, SKUs. SKU is a stock keeping unit. It's the unit of thing that a beer warehouse would sell. It would be something like a carton containing 24, 33 centiliter bottles of beer or 
dozen cans of a different kind of beer, stock keeping units, just the thing that they sell. So it accepts the return SKUs, the quantities being returned and the conditions of the return from the warehouseman. The product generates a credit note. The product adds sellable returns back to stock on hand because remember the, the warehouseman has uh, said what condition all this stuff is in. And the product generates a return report for each of the brands which are not in a sellable condition and that's the end of that puck. Uh, here's another one. The supplier shipment arrives and what the product's going to do is if this is an existing supplier, then for each unique SKU, remember the SKU is the stock keeping unit, it's the thing that they're selling, and so they would put all of the boxes that belong to the same SKU together. So the product accepts the warehouseman scan of the QR codes or the barcode or manually entered SKU, uh, whichever is going to happen, uh, we're allowing our product to do that. It accepts the warehouseman's quantity delivered, he's counted all the cartons as they're arriving, determines the optimal warehouse location. Now this is something the product has to do because different SKUs are going to have different popularity. And so in this case, what the product is doing is saying stack it here or stack it there uh, because they're really stacking for retrieval, if you like. Uh, the more popular brands and the more popular SKUs are going to go to the front and the less popular ones will be put at the back. So I'm demonstrating this functionality that my product's going to have. The product produces a stacking ticket for the SKU so the warehousemen know where to put it. It adds the quantity to the stock on hand so that we know what we've got. It sends a delivery notification to the accounting system, advises of discrepancy between the quantity ordered and delivered, so now we can go ahead and uh, pay the supplier's invoice, and that's the end of that one. Or we can write a story. If you're using agile techniques, you might prefer to write stories instead of a product use case. As a warehouseman, I can receive a delivery so that the beer is available for sale and placed conveniently in the warehouse. Now, this is the story that's going to describe what's going on. And your story has to have enough information that your customer can adequately or your client, let me say, can adequately determine whether or not that's the product that uh, is wanted. So either one is going to work here. The story does not contain as much information uh, because the product use case scenario is going it step by step. It's got a little bit more information to allow stakeholders to uh, make their decision. But keep in mind that either one is going to work. But note that I've written the story at the time of deciding how much of the business use case scenario I'm going to automate. Now once you've written either your story or your product use case scenario, I'm going to present it to my business stakeholders. The reason I want to do that is I want them to be completely aware of what the product is going to do for them. And so by taking them through step by step what's happening or explaining the story to them, I want their agreement. If necessary, they can change it around, say, no, I don't want that, I want to do something slightly different. But at the end, we end up with a description of the product use case or story. One of the reasons I'm suggesting you do this is a lot of organizations give a requirements document to their stakeholders. And this is full of hundreds, if not thousands, of statements saying the product shall do this, the product shall do that, whatever. And this has really given requirements a bad name because nobody can understand these things except the developers. And typically the requirement specification is given to the stakeholders and they have the instructions, read this and sign off if you agree with it. Of course it gets signed, but I think very, very rarely it gets read. So what I'm proposing instead, instead of asking the sign off on the requirement specification, that you use your product use case scenario because you can see how it's only got a limited number of steps, it's not going into grinding detail. And instead of, well, if I give them the requirement specification, it's rather like uh, trying to describe a building by talking about individual bricks. What I'd rather do is give them a document which is going to allow them to understand the flow from beginning to end of one product use case or a story and 
If they have to sign anything, get them to sign off on that.